Good evening. Um, I want to welcome you all today to Story Hour in the library. Um, I'm Melanie Abrams, and uh, Vikram, my husband, and I are the ones that host Story Hour, so thanks for coming on out. Um, just a couple of announcements before I introduced our esteemed readers today. Uh, the first is just our next story hour will be Thursday, November 13th. Um, it's Cornelia Nixon, who is, she's a local writer, um, and she's actually a Berkeley alumni as well, and she teaches at Mills and has a number of books out, so that's a good one to come to. Uh, also, we have on that table where that blinding light is, is a um, mailing list. So if you want announcements on uh, readers who are coming up, uh, go ahead and sign up for our mailing list and we promise not to sell it to uh, <laughs> companies. Um, and the only other thing I'll say before we start is that, um, so uh, both uh, Clark and Baharti's books are on sale, and one that's co-authored actually, um, behind us at the table and I'm sure that they'll be more than happy to sign them for you and they'll be doing that after the reading today. Okay. It's my pleasure today to welcome Baharti Mukherjee and Clark Blaze to the Story Hour reading series. Baharti is most recently the author of The Tree Bride and Desirable Daughters. She is the winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award for The Middleman and Other Stories. Baharti was born in Calcutta and lived in England and India as a child. By the age of 10, she had written several short stories and knew she wanted to be a writer. She received a BA from the University of Calcutta and an MA in English and Ancient Indian Culture from the University of Baroda. She came to the United States as a graduate student at the University of Iowa, where she earned an MFA in Creative Writing and a PhD in English and Comparative Literature. She's lived and taught in Canada and the US. Her work has explored this wealth of experience and learning across cultures, and also the pain and exaltation of journeying across cultural boundaries, of being an alien and then remaking the self, becoming something new in the world. In a Boston Globe review of The Tree Bride, Joanne Skerritt writes, early in Bharti Mukherjee's new novel, the protagonist Tara Chatterjee says she is enough of a mystic to believe there are no coincidences, only convergences. This declaration lays the foundation for an elegantly written novel that travels between centuries, continents, and cultures, and links people past and present, sometimes in far from obvious ways. These links, these unexpected conjunctures, are one of the great pleasures that one finds in Baharti's writing. One of the early links that Baharti forged at the University of Iowa's writing program was with a fellow student, Clark Blaze. As Baharti tells it, I had a two-week courtship with a fellow student in the fiction workshop in Iowa and a five-minute wedding in a lawyer's office above the coffee shop where we'd been having lunch that day. And so I sent a cable to my father saying, by the time you get this, Daddy, I'll be Mrs. Blaze. Clark Blaze was born in Fargo, North Dakota to Canadian parents. He moved frequently with his parents to various American cities, attending school in at least 25 cities before graduating high school in Pittsburgh. He graduated from Denison University before attending the University of Iowa and became a Canadian citizen in 1966. His 22nd book, Volume 1 of his, yes, that's right, his 22nd book, Volume 1 of his selected essays will be published next month, followed by Volume 2 next year. In 2010, he will publish a new book of short stories based on the experience of Indian immigrants. He is currently researching inherited diseases for a forthcoming work, work centered on his family legacy of Alzheimer's and mus muscular dystrophy. As you can gather from this very short summary of current and forthcoming work, Clark is a reader of extraordinary range and ambition. His first two books were a collection of short stories, and the third, the novel Lunar Attractions, won the Books in Canada First Novel Award. Since then, he's published not only short stories, novels, and essays, but also Time Lord, a biography of Sanford Fleming, who invented stand standard time in the 19th century. About this book, Jonathan Kiefer wrote in a review, it isn't Blaze's scholarship, however, that allows him inside Fleming's mind, but rather his empathy and poetic sensibility. The book charms and fascinates precisely because it embraces the romance of a new frontier as first surveyed by a quiet revolutionary. It is this empathy and poetic sensibility that illuminates all of Clark's characters as they explore frontiers both physical and within the self. Clark's explorations extend also to literary form. 
itself. His memoir, I Had a Father, is subtitled A Postmodern Autobiography. In it, the author attempts to come to terms with his chaotic childhood and the absence of his father. The book constructs itself as a mosaic of fragments, a patchwork of memories, and the ongoing search for clues about the ever-changing and ever-traveling father who remains ever-elusive, as does the, right, the writer who reveals himself to us in this search. Baharti and Clark have also successfully managed that most difficult of tasks for a literary couple. They have co-written two books. The first, Days and Night in Calcutta, is a joint account of a year spent in India. The second, The Sorrow and the Terror, is a nonfiction account of the 1985 bombing of an Air India plane, the terrorist attack in Canada's history, the largest terrorist attack in Canada's history. As you see, we have an evening of many riches before us. So. Uh, Please welcome Baharti and Clark, and Clark will be reading first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie, and it's great to be um, here again as the, I think, second time I've had the opportunity to read um, uh, here at Berkeley. Um, I'll be reading a, a um, a nonfiction piece that will serve as the introduction to this book that Melanie just described, this book about inherited disease. Uh, so it's rather melancholy, but I hope it's light in certain ways. I noticed it, it was first published in uh, Brick, a magazine uh, that started in Toronto by uh, Michael Andachi. And f the placement of my essay comes right after that of Peter Dale Scott whom you may, many of you may remember is a, a longtime Berkeley professor of English. Peter Dale Scott was here writing, in, in this uh, magazine, is writing about Cheslov Miłosz, a well-known Berkeley professor, Nobel Prize winner. Um, and what's odd for me is that I should say Peter Dale Scott, though he is long retired and living back in Canada, um, was, however, babysat by my mother in Toronto, I mean in Montreal, so that uh, the, the life, life is full of these convergences as Melanie was talking about. Can everyone hear? Is it, uh, is the, okay. <clears throat> this is called a, del a delayed disclosure. My mother was nearly 40 years old in the bleak pre-wartime spring of 1940 when I was born. I assume it was bleak because it was Fargo, North Dakota in early April. And I know it was pre-war America because my parents had just left Canada to escape it. After my birth, my mother had other pregnancies, but none were carried to term. Doctors said she was too old. They said I had survived, barely, because I was the first pregnancy and was born before my mother had built up antibodies against my father. What that meant exactly was never fully explained, but in my childhood, incompatible RH positive and RH negative blood factors were popular explanations for any problem. The idea of inimical antibodies preventing further pregnancy seemed plausible. It even carried a whiff of censure for the late in life beneath her class and what was generally termed interracial status of my mother's marriage. There was something culturally as well as genetically incompatible between my parents. My father was an uneducated village Quebecer, an elapsed Catholic. My mother was a Manitoba-born Anglo, an anti-Catholic in an almost Northern Irish sort of way. And the city in which they had met and married was Dark Ages, 1930s Montreal. My mother took the doctor's admonitions to heart. She had been vain and perhaps a little loose. She would defied her destiny as a, quote, bachelorette. And there was something trashy about carrying a baby at a grandmother's age. Hers was a poisoned womb. In those years, doctors operated on the Sherlock Holmes principle. Once you've eliminated the impossible, what is left, however improbable, is the answer. I was a weak, impoverished thing. I didn't walk, didn't talk, couldn't sit up. My parents were extraordinarily strong, athletic, physical specimens. I should have been a eugenic marvel. I should have benefited from hybrid hardiness like Manitoba wheat. Instead, I was at best a weed. 65 years ago, there were no tools for genetic inquiry. 
And so there must have been a psychological component to my physical symptoms. Psychoanalysis was in the air. 65 years ago, women, those frigid, castrating, smothering wives and mothers, were blamed for most inexplicable and insidious family disasters. Fathers might be ne'er-do-wells or alcoholics or abusers, but those failings were known and pre-absolved with the predictable outcomes, especially in Dark Ages Montreal. Failure to thrive, as we'd say today, however, required a more subtle analysis. How to explain bedwetting, spastic colon, sissiness, juvenile delinquency? The answer in the words of best-selling pop essayist Philip Wiley was middle-class American momism. Freudian analysis of the problem added heft to Wiley's argument. Moms were modern witches. Obviously, all the kinks and quirks of American dysfunction were the fault of mothers who had been too withholding or too dominating, who denied a breast or exposed it, who'd in enforced potty training too early or neglected it too long, who'd picked up squalling babies too quickly or let them scream incessantly, who'd permitted too much or not enough of just about anything in their secretive and exclusive control of their children. Since perfect physical specimens like my parents were obviously able to conceive, why couldn't she carry them to term? My father had been a Golden Gloves champion in two countries. My mother was an avid ice skater and field hockey player. My father had the arm, shoulders, and barrel chest of a middleweight in a short-legged bantamweight's frame. Even in her mid-fifties, my mother could kick her legs over her head. She could thrum her fingers on a tabletop with the force of small hammers. What was wrong with them together or with her? Maybe she didn't really want children. Perhaps unconsciously, that sophisticated, all-explaining European word, she'd been fighting against the role or definition of motherhood. She'd had a European life. She was educated. She was an artist. She felt superior to her husband and everyone in his furniture salesman's life. Unconsciously, she must have felt she had made a terrible mistake. During her first pregnancy, she had taken all the proper steps as they were understood in 1940. She still smoked, but she gave up driving. My birth was uneventful. She went up to Winnipeg a few months after I was born to be assured by her father, a doctor, don't worry, Annie, he'll never be a boxer. When I was about nine months old, I fell into a mysterious decline. My eyes grew dull, my body toneless. I flopped in my high chair as though I had no bones or spine. One morning, my mother found me with both legs wrapped around my neck, paddling with my hands like a self-propelled beach ball. I stayed physically and mentally undefined until I was three and a half years old. By then, we had moved to Cincinnati, the second of 30 towns and cities, north and south, Canadian and American, where we would live before my parents' inevitable breakup 15 years later. My condition was diagnosed as amatonia congenita, a form of muscular dystrophy that was considered fatal. My mother didn't give up. She read to me, even though I didn't respond. She took me to doctors, finally finding one who prescribed a new wartime thyroid extract. At about the age of four, the pills, or something, kicked in. I sat up, I talked, and I walked. Fifteen years later in Pittsburgh, during the time of my parents' divorce, I asked our family doctor what was wrong with me. I was pudgy, slow, and uncoordinated. Soft. I have never been able to do a push-up. I don't know what it is like to launch a one-handed jump shot. In high school, I weighed a corky 230 pounds, a football lineman's weight lacking only heft and bulk. Most of the moist-skinned, shiny-pants kids my size seem to me stupid as well. Genetic mistakes. Where would my weight gain end? 400 pounds? 500? I could see a limitless freak show trajectory. Was there a name for it when people asked? A form of dystrophy, the doctor said. Amytonia, I asked, and he said, probably not. Be grateful that it keeps you out of gym class. 
Seven years after the Pittsburgh diagnosis, be between college and entering the writer's workshop in Iowa City, I was called up for my army physical. I stood at attention in a line, this is at uh, Fort Des Moines, I stood at attention in a line with nude young farm boys while someone tried to pass a single sheet of paper between my knees. The sheet of paper tore. My, lang my legs form a kind of geometry like two letter K's placed back to back. I would be unable to stand at attention without passing out. Knock need, a congenital deformity, it afforded a respectable deferment. A year later, I was married. Our first son was born while my wife and I were still in the workshop. He was a beautiful, lusty, active baby out of his crib at seven months, dark-haired and light-eyed with a peachy complexion born of my wife's genetic contribution. She is Calcutta-born, the daughter of 3,000 years of obsessive marital supervision. Hybridization actually works, I thought. My mother was one of those supremely rationalistic women of the 1920s, a Canadian version of one of Evelyn Waugh's bright young things, or someone out of the early Aldous Huxley. She could stand in for any number of Alice Munro or Carol Shields heroines. She was a Winnipeg college graduate in arts who'd left her father's stern Methodism and drifted far from her prairie origins into Eastern wisdom, theosophy, and atheism. She aspired to a career in design against her father's inflexible will. So she taught for three years in rural Saskatchewan and Manitoba schools, saved her wages, and in the summer of 1929, took off for Europe. She worked first in London, then dissatisfied with the stodgy standards of local design, removed herself to the center of modernism, Germany. She enrolled in an art school in Dresden and then took classes in Dessau at the Bauhaus. Following the closing of the school by the Nazis in 1932, she escaped to Prague using her German and stayed there until 1935, when friends suggested she might think of leaving. With a Canadian passport, she found herself suddenly desirable in the eyes of many older, interesting, accomplished men. She returned to London for a year, then came back home to Canada. My parents met in Montreal in 1937. My mother was older, taller, heavier, and more educated. He was handsome, raw, ambitious, violent, and effectively illiterate. My jolly grandmother, Oriane Blais, four feet, 10 inches tall, undertaker to 14 of her 19 children, lived with my parents in saint rose du lac Quebec for the final two years of her life. She was once asked my mother, why did a good woman like you marry a boy like Leo? In the fateful month of September 1939, while my mother was pregnant with me, her mother-in-law died. His mother's death was the release my father had been waiting for. My parents left immediately for Winnipeg and then continued to North Dakota. And then the story gets interesting. Over the years, I've taken great comfort from my French-Canadian half-identity. Montreal is the hometown out of 30 contenders that I claim. French-Canadian is the identity I answer to. The happiest years of my life were spent in Montreal. Our younger son was born there, where in those years of ethnic and religious identification, he is registered as a French Hindu. And my wife and I taught there for a dozen years. The life and language of Quebec still delight me. Delight me. The tenacity of that small, threatened culture is heroic. The suffering and poverty, the harsh conditions, the low self-esteem, and the tight little gene pool in which, after 400 years, everyone is related, have always told me everything I needed to know about myself. I have never met a fellow Quebecois anywhere in the world and not been able to discover a common ancestor, a Blé, a Chouinard, a Boucher, a Robert, after a dozen questions. I might have been an only child, but I have six million cousins. After my parents' divorce, my father married two more times and suffered mightily for what he knew to be his sins. The wife he left my mother for tried to kill him on a beach in Mexico. The next one in Manchester, New Hampshire, succeeded. He was 72 and is buried in Le Petit Coin du Canada, in the old French-Canadian ghetto of now gentrifying Manchester, New Hampshire. By then, my mother, who lived 10 more years, did not recognize his name or mine. She died of Alzheimer's at 84 in a nursing home in Winnipeg, the city where she'd started. 
In my growing up, the stories my mother told me of my various potential fathers fired me with nostalgia for a life I couldn't live. This was partial compensation for having an old mother in the rural south of my childhood where toothless grandmothers could be 30 years old or even younger. My mother was in her mid-40s <clears throat> by the time I started school. <clears throat> For us in Pittsburgh or deep in Florida and Georgia or back in Winnipeg, physical and economic life would always be a struggle. We'd always be renting back rooms in other people's houses or duplexes, and there would always be new schools twice a year and new bullies, each town worse than the one before. The few stories my mother told me about her earlier boyfriends, her beaux, as she liked to call them, made them seem like parachuters, dozens of father insurrectionists landing behind family lines. Of course, you wouldn't be you, she'd say, easily detecting the calculation I was making. That was okay with me. I didn't much like the fate I'd been dealt. We wouldn't be in Florida or Georgia or Alabama. We wouldn't even be American. I would be Canadian or European. I'd be cultured. I'd be lean, hard, and athletic. I'd be English or German or Czech or Hungarian. I went to the Atlas and looked up those countries. They were, by the faintest thread of imagination, mine. I'd be Jewish, an artist, or intellectual, or some kind of deposed aristocrat. If my father had been the Toronto architect who figured prominently in many of my mother's London stories, whose old letters she sometimes took out and read, whose accomplishments she was able to trace through the Canadian magazines that followed us in her American exile, what might that have meant for me? My father was the reason, obviously, that I wasn't taller or smarter or richer. I would have settled for some of his good looks and bullish strength, but he didn't pass them on, the selfish bastard. He was the reason we lived among violent people who spoke darkly of traits. He was the one who lied about his origins, covered covered them up, lived a secret life with women, all known to my mother. She had to be friendly with his many mistresses. She had to certify his bogus Paris childhood. He was the one terrified of being discovered, the one who caused us to flee landlords and processors deep in the night. Without him, life wouldn't be so endlessly unfair, such an unwinnable struggle. Your father should be respected. He's had a lot to overcome, she'd say. You have to admire what he's made of himself. All of that was true. Many of my father's traits were admirable. He worked harder than any two men. He had to. He could read the baseball box uh, scores, but little more. He kept up with the exploits of Lou Boudreau and Leo de Rocher. He wrote numbers, not letters. Pencils and ballpoint pens snapped in his hands. Their points ripped through the pages. His life, his constructed French life with a Paris education, with vineyards in the countryside, the E he added to, uh, then added to his last name to make it look more French, was an embarrassment it was an embarrassing lie. If we had moved in more sophisticated circles, he would have been easily exposed. He'd been born poor, Catholic, and French, in a time and place that sent boys off to work or to the priesthood as soon as they could toddle. To have transcended all of that was heroism enough, though he and I didn't honor it at the time. Architects make a lot of money, don't they, I'd ask. They design things, and I was busy filling up writing tablets with plans for future cars, planes, trains, and buildings. That famous Canadian architect who figured in my mother's Manitoba girl against the war London and Dresden and Montreal was still living in Toronto. Toronto was not an architectural triumph 60 or more years ago, but that hardly mattered. Toronto architect still carries an oxymoronic ring to me, unfairly even now. Of course he was married, but he'd been married then too, and studying in London where he met, when he met my mother. That didn't matter. My mother wasn't shy about the implications. Gordon was the love of her life, and she'd met my father on the rebound. My father hid his string of girlfriends. My mother's lovers were all embedded in history. Many years after she was gone, I learned to appreciate the fact that a first-time 40-year-old mother had had a full life, she had done her living and growing before I was born. She was always a fully formed individual. She seemed to me infallible. But our years together were numbered. Alzheimer's began claiming her by her mid-60s, my age now. I was still in my mid-20s. We would never be adults together. Her full life is one I'll never know. The absence fills me with wonder and regret. 
What she gave me is a gift of the right to imagine alternate selves, what she and I might have been, and to frame her life as a rather dazzling young woman, free of cares, free of me. The city she talked of, especially Montreal, became mine. It has taken many years for the mystery of my mother's poisoned womb to resolve itself. In the past few years, the old amitonia congenita, my mysterious dystrophy, has reappeared. It's now called myotonic dystrophy, one of the many forms of muscular dystrophy, and doctors have realized it is inherited, not congenital. As modern genetics has discovered, each of my children has a 50-50 chance of inheriting the trait. Half of our genetic makeup comes from each parent. I have two good alleles, genes, uh, from my mother, and one good and one bad from my father. I assume that many of my mother's pregnancies were spontaneously aborted because of myotonic dystrophy. It is the mysterious antibody, the source of the poisoned womb. In my marriage, my wife contributed two sturdy Bengali alleles. If a child inherits my good, my good one from my, from my mother and either of my wife's, he or she is entirely free of the problem. It will never occur. It is not part of his or her DNA. But if, any, but if my father's bad allele shows up, it is dominant and will cause the victim to create huge numbers of genetic copies in a kind of stutter, like zebra mollusks clogging up an intake pipe. The muscles are literally starved of sugar. Myotonic dystrophy is almost the reverse phenomenon of that experienced by, say, Jerry Lewis's young chair-bound Duchenne sufferers. My <clears throat> Though fatal, myotonic dystrophy is obviously the preferable of the two forms of dystrophic illness. It presents later in life, in adolescence, at about the time Duchenne's has claimed its victim. Myotonic dystrophy starts in the limbs and migrates to the trunk. It moves slowly. Myotonic sufferers cannot relax their clenched muscles. They're subject to apnea and cardiac arrhythmia. One by one, the muscles die. The little muscles of the ears leading to deafness, the little muscles of the eyes and eyelids bringing on blindness, speech slurs. Our older boy noticed in high school, even as he ran high hurdles, that if he balled up his fist, he had to unfurl it finger by finger with the other hand. My wife and I never knew, and he thought nothing of it, not that anything could have been done. A couple of years ago, the effects became increasingly apparent. We did the modern thing and took DNA samples. My myotonic dystrophy is mild with 60 genetic replications, 60 stutters. My older boy, the active little beauty in our family, is classic with 180. It is strangely comforting to finally have a name for everything that can possibly go wrong, a new identity to go with all the others, and a certain fate. I wish only I could have gone it alone. Fortunately, says the medical literature, the genetic drift that causes the condition is limited mainly to isolated pockets, those small population gene pools grown stagnant from long interbreeding. A classic outcropping, the world center in fact, is the Lac Saint-Jean region of Quebec. Possibly my father had no more than 20 replications, not enough to register a single complication on his magnificent physique but it is the nature of the condition to increase the stutter generation by generation and for our dark secret trait to grow more devastating until nothing remains. I still cherish my millions of cousins and the living fact that in Quebec we are all linked by fewer than six degrees of separation. On each visit to Montreal, I take new pride in my people's self-reinvention, even as I see them now in my dreams, robed and hooded, chanting prayers against a new enemy I know too well. Thank you. Now for something completely different from the spouse with the two sturdy, healthy Bengali alleles. But I have a lot of other problems to make up for that. Um, I'm going to read, this is like a stupid and bold thing to do, uh, from a novel that will come out in a year's time. I just uh, heard from uh, 
rather nice things from my agent and editor today. So I feel emboldened to read at least a tiny bit and leave uh, enough time for questions, especially how husband and wife do their uh, Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers number. You're all too young to remember that couple, but hey. Um, the novel that I'm going to read from uh, started out with a very different name. When I proposed it to my original publisher, it was called Bangalore by the Bay, and it was meant to be tangentially at least the third standalone novel in a trilogy that began with Desirable Daughters, went on to uh, Tree Bride, and then it was going to be Bangalore by the Bay. And Desirable Daughters was, I couldn't write about my sisters and myself coming to the States and how life changed in very different ways for each of us. So I made it into fiction and took many liberties, especially about sexual escape, escapades and so on. And it became, you know, uh, finding the new world, either rejecting or belonging to the new world and desirable daughters. And then when I finished the last scene there, I realized, oh my goodness, I thought I knew everything there was. In fact, I knew too much in a claustrophobic stranglehold way about my family history, names of every generation on the male side, and you know who had done what, and slanders and humiliations and insults preserved over decades and decades. But I didn't really know how I had been shaped, people like me had been shaped, not just by individual desire, but by colonial history, and therefore choice of language that I write in, and uh, gender relations in the old world, my grandparents' generation, and so on. So that I thought I was American, but not an American in the way that my white and African-American writer contemporary women might be, and that I have to always sort of play with how history has controlled me, shaped me, and how I have uh, resisted or given into history. Well, Bangalore by the Bay was going to be about the children's generation, the younger people. And uh, my publisher, original publisher, went out of business. Well, not it was bought out by other people. And so it meant that I was free suddenly to rethink parts of the novel. And it became, as I kept writing the draft, it became no longer Bangalore by the Bay, but Miss New India. And it's about a young woman who works at call centers in Bangalore and has to be American in ersatz ways, you know, the faux American, where you have to uh, expose yourself training uh, through sign watching hours of Seinfeld and Sex in the City and learn to give yourself a biography about you were born in Rock City, 350 population, where the high school was, et cetera, et cetera. So it's playing uh, with all of that. But I'm going to read a very short section, and then Clark and I will happily answer any questions that you might have about writing life, love life, not the love life. <laughs> OK. This is the prologue. In the second half of the last century, young Americans, the disillusioned, the reckless, the hopeful, began streaming into India. They came overland in painted vans, on dust-choked diesel-spouting buses, and on the hard benches of third-class railroad cars, wearing Indian clothes, eating Indian street food, and drinking the people's water. 
the disaffected children of American affluence. College dropouts, draft dodgers, romantics, druggies, and common criminals. Musicians, hedonists, and starry-eyed self-discoverers. Not always the cream of America's youth, but something new in India's history. These weren't the aloof and scornful British administrators or the roustabout traders of earlier centuries. You could see them at dawn or dusk, pounding out their kurtas on flat stones along the riverbank, like any dhobi or housemaid. These rich Westerners, the Aussies, the Canadians, the Germans, the Finns, but especially the Americans, the ones who stayed a few months, then years, lived like poor villagers. Rich Western kids who sometimes begged and got sick and others died from beggars' diseases. Among them, one in a hundred, a thousand, 10,000, became reborn with no interest in returning. They settled down in towns and villages, learned the languages, and lived Indian lives. They took modest jobs with foundations and charities. They taught English and took to the countryside to collect music and folk tales, arts and crafts. They married local girls or stayed celibate and identified themselves with Indian needs and aspirations. Until connecting with India, their lives had seemed without purpose. Their real lives began in India, for all its bribery, assassinations, race riots, and corruption. They rarely spoke of their old American lives, and if they did, never boastfully. Truly, America had been wiped from their memories at precisely the time young Indians were fantasizing about the West, wanting to know more, wanting schools and jobs and that promised freedom. We were hungry for America, but they were sated with it. When America stumbled through wars and what have you, they professed no interest. But when India stumbled, they mourned. We might skip a step or two, shrug and move on, but they fell flat on their faces. And still they loved us more than we loved ourselves. We thought he was strange. In our tradition, professors carry their precious, timeless, immutable lectures typed on foolscap, tucked inside dossiers tied with silk thread, and ceremoniously read them in a monotone, not looking up until the bell rings. Generations of students had learned to rank their teachers by their level of flatulence. Elephant farts for our South Indian and Goan priests, down to mouse farts, a little gas that at least left a pellet of knowledge behind, even some wisdom. He came to class empty-handed. The senior professors boasted of medals they'd won in high school and college, of their epic mental journeys and alluded to six-week grants that had taken them 30 years earlier to England or perhaps Australia to touch a sacred manuscript or sit at the feet of Sir Somebody or Other, a celebrated master. They spoke of the chasm that separated their achievements from one potential. But the American joked about his average grades and his wandering about his country, then India, looking for a profession. He'd won no honors. In fact, he'd admitted barely passing out of college because his interests were literally too widely spaced. He studied archaeology, astronomy, and geology, linguistics, mathematics, and religion, anything without a clear beginning that teased infinity and seemed open-ended. And yet, it's his influence that hangs over us, some of us, like the vault of heaven. When he'd arrived among us, America was at war, so he opted for the Peace Corps and was assigned to a village in Bihar. After two years, 40 pounds lighter, immune to diseases that would flatten most villagers, fluent in dialects no white man had ever mastered, he embarked on a countrywide study of Raj-era houses and public buildings. Of course, we didn't know this at the time. We were an incurious lot, accustomed to secret ridicule of the teaching staff. There was no internet or Google. Everything this American learned, he gathered by tramping through villages and towns where children who'd never seen a white man would pinch his arms and face. 
His facility with languages and his obvious respect for the history and culture of villages and the long ignored small towns, the Mufasils, the rundown neighborhoods of the larger cities, opened doors and delivered documents. He was always alone, and he traveled like a villager with two days' change of clothes tied in a bundle and knotted on a stick. He moved in with families and listened to their stories and took inventories of original paintings and furniture long before their eventual appearance in Madison Avenue boutiques or Sotheby's catalogs. Wherever he went, he left humble people with a sense of renewed destiny. He listened to their songs, their long litanies of local history and family memories. None of us knew of his books and articles. Teachers in colleges like ours did not write or conduct research and were uneasy with originality. We knew he went to villages on his scooter and recorded songs. He discovered and cataloged shards of terracotta sculptures. He scarred old deserted temples. And gradually, he pieced together an eccentric history of modern India, chapters published in antiquarian Indian journals, and two books published abroad before the evolution of a local audience. He lived on a teacher's modest salary, monk-like, in a Bihar Mufasil town, teaching converse, conversational English and commercial models. One, our American was a mystery to 30 years of students. Every now and then, he conferred special attention on a young man or woman. You will carry on, he would say. You have the spark. Don't crash and burn. India is starting to wake up. India is a giant still in his bed, but beginning to stir himself. It's too late for me, but India is catching fire. One such woman is named Anjali Bose. She traced the path of a teacher from north to south, even to the same house he'd made famous, never suspecting she was anything but the beneficiary of a professor's generosity. And it becomes then the story of uh, Anjali, who starts out you know, from backwater town with no prospects except ambition and a kind of fluency in language, but not very good grades. And it takes her into many adventures in many towns, easy disposable monies, lots of admirers with some of whom she has sex, money, and I won't give the rest of it <laughs> away, but I'd rather keep the rest in, instead of reading another excerpt that I'd intended, I'd rather that we did our little song and dance number. questions? How did you go about researching the, your book? Did you go to India for call center or life? Or? Oh, God, yes. Many, many trips. And I, I'm just going to get my glasses so that I can see you. I'm going to get my glasses. Clark, Clark was with me on uh, every research trip, so if you want to start talking about it. Well, we, yes, we, uh, we concentrated just on Bangalore because we could we could have gone to Calcutta or Gurgaon and a number of there uh, Bombay, uh, Mumbai. There are a number of uh, cities that would have satisfied the thing, but Bangalore is the city that really is uh, um, exfoliating with all this new money and all this new uh, um, confidence. And so we, uh, we were there on two or three occasions. And she, and she has a cousin who lived there, and we were able to stay. <laughs> but one time at least free, the other times not. And we've been even, even one way of mount, uh, is just to check the mounting uh, uh, hotel bills. You know, at one time it was 60 or $70 a night, and now it's 400 or 500 And I just, if it's you just. You are lucky enough to find a place. Yes. The various companies are now having to build their own hotels. And we uh, were very lucky about sources, contacts. And so uh, we're able to 
interview an awful lot of people, the call center um, agents, and then the, they called customer support service people. And uh, the trainers, English language trainers, as well as the business people, America, Indo-Americans going there, or American Hewlett Packard, and so on. And we were able to liberate a lot of the training manuals. So that came in very handy in the novel. It's hilarious, I mean, you know, like the way that they are made to be American in the way in which you have to keep reciting the raven. So it's not say raven. The V, you know, <laughs> the, v, the, the v different, sound, uh, different uh, Indians from different states have trouble with either F, P, and V, and W. People from Bengal uh, don't have, the Bengali alphabet doesn't have F in it. So poggiest notion. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or garment, garment for government. So the raven is one of the standard manual training techniques to say the raven and especially is when you get, And especially when you get quoth the in, in yes. th, th in a row. Quoth the. <laughs> no, I mean, I still have trouble with uh, th unless I'm thinking very hard. And I came as a student, you know, with perfect British English, except that C-O-M-B was comb, not comb. And the first fight that uh, Clark and I had within two weeks of our marriage was we were doing charades in some, you know, married students, housing, and all that. And... It was kiln, right? Yes. Right. I knew it as... Kiln. Kiln. And he knew it as kill. And so we lost that charade game. <laughs> and we never lost word games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Um, it's a good question. Um, I've done more nonfiction, I think, than Bahardi has. Uh, um, I do enjoy the research for nonfiction enormously. Uh, it gives you a period of grace there before you have to start writing in which you really know something you, you, and you feel on a daily basis. Right now I'm doing genetics uh, and genetic diseases and so I'm reading all these genetic books and reading about Evo Devo uh, evolution and cell development, wonderful stuff. Before that when I was doing the, uh, the Time Lord on, 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 uh, on Standard Time, wonderful. Coming to write it is, you know, that's a, that's a different question. I don't particularly enjoy the, re, the, the uh, uh, research for fiction because the, the real thing about fiction is, is the character. It's not, you know, it's good to have a setting, it's good to have plot, it's good to be able to verify in that Flaubertian way um, that this is there and this is that, that street is, crosses this street and that, that area is called this and there. You know, that, those are all necessary parts of research, but they're, they're infantile in some way. And the yeah, real thing is. agree. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I find that I do enormous amounts of research, even for fiction, just to get my confidence up. And then I get so lost in research. I may use only a t one tenth, one hundredth of it, but I have to know exactly what people were wearing, where the, the Flaubertian, you know, what street crossed what street, what the weather was like at that time. And for one of my novels, uh, The Holder of the World, which is a reimagining of Pearl Prynne, Hester Prynne, Scarlet Letter, um, I did 11 years of research into, you know, shipping routes. And, but once I get to write, I put all the notes away so that it's not in the way, but it should be in my head, in my uh, pores, and waiting to come out for uh, desirable. You know, thank God, I couldn't write if I only had an attic. 
Um, I have to be part of the university because I need the library desperately. And so, you know, I just take out whole shelves of uh, books on colonial 19th century India, etc., and have indesirable daughters um, versions of. I mean, I made up the numbers so that I wouldn't be uh, caught plagiarizing, but histories of uh, British cops punishing freedom fighters. How many lashes for what, what kind of floggings, who, how many people, women were raped on certain. Uh, but I want, like Clark, I totally believe that once you've gotten the material, then for fiction, you got to go with the psychology, go with the character, let the character dictate. There are some writers, and you know, I l loved, admired Susan Sontag, but I always felt about the volcano lover that there were too many huge chunks of undigested, undramatized uh, scholarly information, historical information, and that I want it to be somehow an automatic part of the character rather than, look, ma, no hands, how smart I am and how much homework I did. Non-fiction, but I mean, there's a, a fictional component to recreating your, your mother, your father, even that sure. child who you imagine as yourself. Mm. You know. mm. so, so, anyway, I mean, how do you how do you uh, how do you trade today? We have, we have a two-floor house, and her study's on one floor, and my study's on the other, and... Uh, and often we have been in different cities, you know, like different parts of the country. <laughs> yeah, well, quite often we, we've had split jobs. Um, here now, it's just a matter of Tuesday and Thursday, we, we're in Berkeley, but the other five days of the week, uh, we're in our own study doing our own thing all day. It's just the only time we meet is when it's time to walk the dog. That's, that's it. <laughs> No, and to watch Colbert. Not Colbert, the other yeah, yeah, guy, Col Keith Olbermann. Yeah, Keith I like Olbermann. Five I like to have my glass of red wine and watch Keith Olbermann. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are little rituals, yeah. Hey, Clark. Um, okay, Chris. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your book, Short Stories? Yeah, that, that's uh, a book about, they're all Indian immigrant stories. So the, um, a couple of them are found in, in the world body, if you have the, it's for sale back there. Um, they're all stories about Indian immigrants to North America, either Canada or the US, mainly US, mainly actually San Francisco. And the characters are, um, you know, successful, I and mean, that is they've, they've done well, as Indian immigrants often have here, mainly have, um, but they are missing, they feel they are missing something, and uh, um, some of them, uh, and I've tried, to, uh, I've tried to write about Christians, Hindus, Muslims, uh, Parsis, um, you know, the whole um, Indian pantheon, um, but some of them, they can't go back for one reason or another. I mean, the, the reason, one, one that I'm writing about right now, she's a, a Goan uh, editor, and she can't go back to India because all of the airlines are smoke-free. And she knows that she cannot be without a cigarette more than an hour. And so she is effectively a, uh, you know, an exile, uh, you know, in North America because of that. But I mean, it, you know, the little things like that. It's... Uh, I, I, I think living 45 years uh, in India, with India, under India, over India, you know, and making so many trips back, uh, many dozens of trips to India. It's those healthy, too sturdy aliens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That because of that, uh, I had written a lot about um, Americans or Canadians in India. Uh, I was confident about the, getting the setting right, but the next leap is to try to get into the consciousness of, of Indians, and we'll see if it's 
been successful. The last three years, I've had a story each year in best Canadian short stories, which have been all of these Indian stories. So at least I've fooled somebody. I don't know. Yeah, no, yeah. but I want to just extend that to say that there was an era, late 80s, early, throughout the 90s, when rights of representation and Vikram has written a fiery essay about that, that uh, anyone who wrote about a group, gender, class, not biographically authentic would be in trouble. And so I want all the writer, young writers here to realize that that's, that kind of political correctness is not what a writer should be paying attention to. If you can imagine yourself into another life, and if you can do that persuasively, then go do it. <laughs> the assassins of the imagination. Yes, is what I had said in a Harper's article. Yeah, one last question. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.